episode contains references to suicide, physical restraint, and sexual violence. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening. I'm Carrie Michael, and you're listening to Speak Up Arkansas on KABF 88.3 FM. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. It's estimated that close to a billion people worldwide have a mental health condition. The World Health Organization estimates that between 5.7 and 8% of adults suffer from depression, yet nearly two-thirds of people with a known mental health condition never seek treatment. Why is this when mental health challenges are so widespread in the U.S. and across the globe? We know there's a strong stigma against mental health conditions that persists even still in 2022. We know that that's still happening, but there are other barriers, financial barriers. There are racial disparities that are glaring, too much need and not enough mental health professionals, and a lack of awareness about mental health all play a role. Today on Speak Up Arkansas, we're talking about mental health and mental health access in Arkansas. Who seeks treatment? What do treatment options in our state look like? How are we as a state responding to what many characterize as a mental health crisis in our country as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? And what can we do to ensure that those who are suffering most are able to get help? Disability Rights Arkansas is proud to be a part of KABF's weekly Speak Up Arkansas program to encourage dialogue about the issues that matter most to people with disabilities, their families and caregivers, and to educate the public about these issues. To make Arkansas a truly inclusive state where everyone's personhood and contributions are valued. The show is pre-recorded, so we won't be taking calls, but we welcome your questions and comments. Give us a call at 800-482-1174, or you can find us online at www.disabilityrightsar.org. We're also on Facebook at Disability Rights AR, and you'll find us on Twitter at DR Arkansas. So um, I have got a fantastic panel with me this evening, so allow me the opportunity to introduce our guests. Uh, First up, Elaine Williams is a member of Disability Rights Arkansas's PAMI Advisory Council. PAMI, P-A-I-M-I, is an acronym that stands for Protection and Advocacy of Individuals with Mental Illness. Um, Elaine is a member of the Arkansas Client Voice Council. She has a background in psychology and has worked in the mental health field for over 20 years. She lives and works in Prescott. Leslie Bagley is a person living with a mental health condition. Hi, Leslie. She managed to graduate both high school and college with honors, all while dealing with her mental health issues in secret. Today, she is a mental health advocate working to give a voice to those who don't have one. And last but certainly not least, by any means, Luke Kramer is the Vice President of Patient Advocacy and Community Engagement at Evolution Research Group. Luke worked at Birch Tree Communities, a nonprofit mental health facility here in Arkansas for 17 years before starting a nonprofit, the Star Coalition, where he focused on advocating for more cutting edge mental health research. Uh, this is a killer panel. We're so happy to have you all. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having us, Carrie. Thank you. Thank so you glad so much. to have you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into it. There's so much to talk about. Um, Leslie, you and I spoke very, very briefly. Leslie and I have only recently just met, but um, but her survivor story is a compelling one, and she's graciously agreed to share it. So I thought we might kick it off, uh, Leslie, if you don't mind uh, okay. sharing a little bit about your lived experience with this issue, mm-hmm. just to frame the discussion today. So my name is Leslie Badley, and I'm a person living with a mental illness. At first, I was just surviving with it, but now I am thriving with the mental illness. I first got sick back when I was 14. I had a huge mental episode or a nervous breakdown when I went to numerous doctors and mental health facilities, and they diagnosed me with depression. I kept all my other symptoms a secret. I had delusions, hallucinations, paranoia, mania, and the depression. I also dealt with severe insomnia. It was my secret shame. I was embarrassed and ashamed and in denial over my mental health. I knew if I told the doctors that they would pump me full of meds and force me to go to hospitals, 
back then, and back then it was called Looney Bins or Crazy Town. And the stigma made it even harder to have mental illness. My teenage years were terrible. My twenties were worse, but my thirties were amazing. And now I'm 40 and I know my forties will just keep getting better and better. When I hit 21, I went wild, did dangerous things to myself and others. And my symptoms were out of control, but I was able to graduate high school and college with honors. Although I was you know, mentally sick, I do have a bachelor's degree in uh, early childhood education. So my family truly loves me, but they couldn't help me. I need to be diagnosed and treated for my mental ill health issues. You see me now thriving with my mental illness, but I was super sick. If you would have seen me when I was at my worst, but now you see me at my best. Birch Tree communities really helped me. Birch is a necessary entity that really helps people. Birch Tree was my saving grace. So I got on the right meds and it took a lot of testing for the doctors to get me on the right meds. My main medicine is Clozaril. It's a really, it was a miracle drug for me. That helped me and it was a very high powered medicine. So all my other doctors had told my mom that I would never recover and that I would have to be in a group home or be in and out of hospitals and be on very strong medicines that probably wouldn't work. There was no hope. I even made a suicide attempt. I was constantly contemplating suicide and I had all sorts of ways that I would think of. I used to say in my head that I was fat, ugly, and I hate myself. And then it changed to I'm fat, ugly, I hate myself, and I want to die. I thought that my life didn't matter, that I was just useless. Now I have changed the narrative in my head with positive self-affirmations. I say it every day to myself. I am strong. I am important. I am worthy. I am intelligent. I am cheerful. I'm happy. I am a beautiful woman of God, a precious gem, and a child of the Most High God. And I say those things to myself every single day. Now I have not had a suicide thought in a little over 11 years. I truly love myself now. I have an awesome, significant other that I have been with for over 10 years. I have a set house, a car, amazing job at AHC Birch Tree. I had started out as a member of Birch, and then I went to a member and a staff, and now I'm graduated up to, do, to being just a staff. I love my job, it's very fulfilling. But the best advice that I can give you is just be nice and treat our peers how you would like to be treated or your family. Anyone can have a mental illness, like your mama, your child, your uncle, your best friend, or even yourself. So treat the members and even the staff with dignity, kindness, and respect. When you go to work with peers, just be nice and don't hold a grudge. Don't let your feelings affect your job. So keep work, work, your work at work in your home at home. You have to remember that members deal with extreme symptoms. So don't take it to heart when someone is rude to you. Just forgive that person and let it go. Be positive and cheerful every day, no matter how you feel. So I'm glad that I am alive. If I would have actually committed the suicide, then I wouldn't have this beautiful life. I would not have met my nieces. I would not have met my significant other. I would have my awesome job. I wouldn't have been present to tell my story and all my friends that I've made. I wouldn't have helped all the people that I've helped, that I affected. The suicide would have killed my mom, especially, and ultimately she is the main reason that I didn't commit the suicide. There was a lot of people along the way that helped me in my recovery. The doctors and therapists did help me, but so did the cooks, the nurses, the transportation people, case managers, peers, even the janitors and my family. Everybody is unique to everyone. So uh, everybody's recovery will look different. And even when somebody's having issues and you might think there is no, no hope for some of our people, what you do matters. People remember how someone treated them. You really have to have a heart for this. And it's not just any job. Birch Tree is a wonderful place. We really do help men and women who have a mental illness. We need a birch tree and other programs just like it. So now I am go to Stride House, the mental health program that is more independent. Everyone is focused on recovery. We all are kind and are, we're all friends. I've been going to Stride House three years. So Stride House has helped me to grow as a person. I'm not a first person with mental illness, nor am I the last. Well, thank you for sharing that.
Leslie, thank you. I, you know, I mean, first of all, I, I, I just want to tell you that we're all so glad that you are, you know, that you're a survivor and that you're here to um, share your story and, and, you know, kind of a message of hope for so many other people. Um, all of us appreciate that. Um, I have, I have so many questions, but, um, but, but first, you know, I want to ask uh, really quickly about Birch Tree Communities, because you referenced it a couple of times, and, and Luke, you've been involved with them as well. So I, I would love to hear um, what, you know, what Birch Tree Communities is, and, and, you know, tell me a little bit. So that was inpatient treatment? It's uh, both Inpatient and outpatient kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Birch Tree, they they have um, I think about twelve or thirteen locations around the state of Arkansas, and um, they work with a lot of individuals who have come from like the state hospital or private hospitals. So sometimes people are trying to kind of reintegrate back into the community for the very first time um, uh, since uh, a diagnosis or they've had to be re-hospitalized just because of the severity of the symptoms so they work with about a, a around 400, 400. Yeah, about 400 um arkansans uh, who need um really kind of specialized care Care, more acute care, but they do everything from residential where people live independently in the community and may just come in for therapy sessions all the way to a 16 bed uh, crisis unit. So if someone needs to uh, be in a place where they're safe and comfortable, um, it, mostly when they're experiencing uh, more uh, difficult symptoms, that there's a place for that there. So it's a whole continuum of care. Um, and it's kind of a shotgun pattern into North Central Arkansas. Uh, so they've, um, they've got sites that are, uh, again, kind of run the full spectrum of, of care. It's a great organization. They're real focused on recovery. Recovery, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and Uba, can you talk about recovery just for a second? Because the idea may not be familiar yes. when people hear it. So you, you, you might start off being sick and you don't know what to do. But just, just know that you are not alone, that people can help. Birch Tree is a, a clubhouse mentality where everybody gets together and we eat meals together, we do chores together, we go to group together, we do fun things together. We just share our stories and the other people in the group you're with, they can share it too. And you get to spend time with the same people. So you grow to know each other and grow to talking and being able to support each other. Birch really helps. It really helped me, but it was my favorite grade. It's a great organization. It's a really great organization. It sure it's sounds like it. It's a place for recovery. They actually gave me a voice. Um, they have something called Member Executive Council, and it's where members from different sites, uh, two or three per site, will come down to a central location and have a meeting. And at the Member Executive Council, we call it MEC. Um, we help make decisions. We talk about what's up, what the upcoming events are. How can we help with policy? How can we spread each other's voice? And also, we get to do fun things too. Um, the member council. First day I went, I felt accepted. I had a voice. It was just amazing. So we get we got together. We meet all of our friends. We have actual parties and get-togethers and. Uh, dances. I mean, it's it's a fun place to be there. I think fun is really important for our members to at least have something that they can memories that they can access that are fun and happy instead of just dwelling on the past and, and being negative and dwelling on their illness. It's not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. I love that. Well, and I think too, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of, you know, fun and also purpose. Um, but I think whether you are in, you know, whether you're in a facility like that, or just out there coping in, you know, in whatever way that you can, it's so important to understand that uh, a mental health condition or a mental health challenge is, is part of what you're struggling with, but it's not who you are. There is so much more uh, to who you are. And, um, and that's really, really important. Um, 
Elaine, I'd love to bring you into the conversation just to ask you a little bit about um, about the work that you all are doing. Um, I'd love to hear what you've got going on in Prescott, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your work on the PAMI Advisory Council, which is part of, um, it's a body that helps advise uh, disability rights. Can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with that group and what that entails? Yes, I, I am and have always been an advocate for uh, people uh, with mental uh, illness, mental health issues. Um, my big thing here uh, in Prescott where I am is I want to remove the, somehow I want to remove the stigma of mental. Uh, if I could get that out of, actually if I could get mental out of the way of health, I think more people would be more responsive to receiving uh, the help that they need. So, you know, now I am, what I'm trying to do now is just say, it's health, health, health is what I'm trying to do. Take the mental off of it because people tend to shy away from uh, mental health services because they don't want to be exposed when people think that maybe, you know, they're, they're in a different zone than what a, uh, an average person is. And, and you know, with that being said, we all have, we all have some mental health issues. We all deal with that as well. You know, and you know, most of us that deal with it, we actually just actually put that aside and use the health part of it. And because we all have health issues, if you really look at the situation. And so my thing is because there are a lot of young adults that that's dealing with some mental health issues. They are ashamed, they are embarrassed. And so it's actually tearing them apart. So I actually do work with a group of uh, people, young adults, trying to remove this stigma as, you know, we know you're not okay. We want to help you, but you've got to help yourself. In order to be able to do that, it has to begin with you being aware of you needing help and not be ashamed of it. And so that's the process that I'm in right now, trying to remove the mental off of mental health so that these people can, individuals can get the help that they actually need. Not only do uh, that helps them, but it helps me as well. So that's kind of where we are. You know, it's 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 remarkable that the stigma um, still persists in 2022. Um, do you see any progress being made towards that? I, I really do see progress. I really do, because I, I think that people are looking more at receiving the health now versus uh, the stigma of just being mental, you know, mental health altogether. It has, it has been more receptive here uh, in Prescott, uh, mainly due to being more involved in some group, group therapy and, and seeing some people come forward uh, that you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think that would have come forward to, to ask for help. So I do see it progressing. We still have a long ways to go. We have a long ways to go. But I think we're on the road to uh, getting to where we need to get to, to reach some people that really need the help. Yeah, I know that uh, former Representative Patrick Kennedy uh, came to the state capitol to speak several years ago, and, and Leslie spoke with him as well. Um, and I remember him saying something, you know, we, I dream for a day that diseases above the neck are treated the same as diseases below the neck. Neck. Mm -hmm. And for and, and to your point, uh, Ms. Williams, you're absolutely correct. There, people tend to think that there's something wrong with another individual if they have a brain disorder, but yet, you know, if they have uh, liver cancer or if they're dealing with a broken leg, it's not anything that, that you know, it, it's, we will talk about it openly. Um, mm -hmm. I think that popular culture is moving a bit to try to be more sensitive about how they address mental illness. I know that in, a, in the past watching shows like Law and Order, it was always the person with the mental illness who did the murder or, or whatever it may yes. be, when, when yes. in reality, you're 12 times more likely to be the victim of That's violence. Right. 
response rather than the perpetrator if you have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So I think that people are redefining a bit. And I know that even with COVID, um, it has, uh, we have opened up a bit talking a little bit more about uh, mental illness because of the isolation and because of the depression and sometimes the loss people have had mm -hmm. um, even during this uh, pandemic. Um, so hopefully that, yes, uh, that, uh, Carrie, that the, the momentum is shifting, that maybe the dialogue is shifting and maybe our narrative is shifting around mental health, that we, um, that we feel more comfortable seeking that help. Because uh, statistically, it takes 10 years for somebody from the first episode uh, uh, on average to reach out for help. So 10 years goes by on average for individuals living with depression or anxiety or schizophrenia, or bipolar or other, other um, uh, illnesses before they ever reach out for help. And we just don't do that with other disease states. We just don't do that. We really don't. And when I hear that number, Leslie, I immediately think of your story about the years that you spent you know, in your youth trying to hide what must have been experienced as some pretty, you know, it sounded like some pretty profound symptoms that you were uh, trying to manage all on your own. Well, it wasn't exactly all on my own. I had a pretty good structure, but my mom was the best. She stood by me through the thick and the thin when it got really, really bad. She never stopped advocating for me. She never stopped loving me. She never saw, she never treated me differently. She just, she was there. She loved me. And I had a lot of family that loved me too and friends, but I'm not, I don't know, it just happened to me. I just got this mental illness. I didn't ask for it. I didn't do anything wrong. It just happened to me. And, you know, I've, I've been through a lot of trauma as well. They talk about trauma-informed care where you ask, you know, what happened to you, not what's wrong with you. And it's, it's a difficult thing to, but you want to keep it a secret because you don't want people thinking you're crazy, you know, and, that, that was kind of hard going to school, knowing that everybody's kind of talking about me. It's a small school, so everybody knew what was going on. Of course, they didn't know a lot of the symptoms, but they knew I was having issues and doing weird things and stuff. But I've, I've lived through a lot. You know, I've even been raped before. And they I went to the emergency room. I'm not going to tell all the details, but they told me that I wasn't raped. They said that, uh, you know, you have a mental illness. You take mental health meds. You were just off your meds. It was just in your head. That didn't really happen. And then I've been in and out of hospitals and stuff, which um, back when I was 14, the hospitals were terrible. But now I went a few years back. I did have a stint to go to uh, Malvern Sock. Their facility and their treatment of the members was really good. It, it's gotten a lot better. I, I can tell that. They're more focused on recovery. They're more focused on helping the individual as a whole. Where back in the day, it's like they just want to lock you away and drug you. Mm -hmm. and I mean, really drug you. Mm -hmm. At one point, I was at a hospital where I get when I get closed in place, I, I pace, and the nurses told me if I did it again, they were going that uh, they were gonna give me some a shot. Eventually, well, I kept walking. So they took me down, gave me a shot. And in the process, they actually pulled my pants uh, off of me and I was I was exposed to the entire unit. So that that was that's really rough. You know, it, it just goes to show that hopefully we can we can live in a world where this type of thing just simply doesn't happen. Yeah. And no one should be subjected to this thing. And when we talk about uh, the trauma-informed care, it, you know, we they say statistically about 90% of individuals that have a, a, a diagnosis have experienced some form of trauma. And so we have to be very sensitive to that. In, in a, an incident like that to happen to Leslie after what she's experienced in her life, this, uh, you know, it, and they say generally about 80% of the people who are, um, who are hospitalized in an institution like a, a, a lockdown unit or a, a hospital like this um, experience uh, uh, situations that can actually cause them to be diagnosed with PTSD. So here we are in a care facility re-traumatizing people over and over again. But again, as Leslie said, we hope we're moving away from that and, and, and yeah. we can correct this problem. A lot of, I'm sorry, Leslie, go ahead. Yes, uh, Birch Tree is, you know, the mental health facility that I'm most familiar with. It really is an amazing place, and I hope that they keep it open forever. 
I know they're going to keep evolving and try to keep mental health awareness going because our mental health does matter. Um, mental health is health and we should be treated with dignity, respect and kindness. You know, everybody deserves to be treated as a person because that's all we are. We're all just people, you know, we we are all different, but we're all, all the same as it. we're actual people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you brought up an interesting, that's absolutely right. And, and I think we're learning a lot about, I mean, the way we talk about trauma is changing. Um, it's evolving as it needs to, you know, and, and everyone um, who deals with people needs to become more trauma informed about it. Um, here at Disability Rights, we do a lot of work around um, we do monitoring of um, psychiatric residential treatment facilities for youth, among other things. Um, and, you know, I, uh, in our show notes for this show, I'd be glad to link back. We've talked about uh, the PRTFs, the psychiatric residential treatment facilities on our show before. Um, and some of the deep concerns that we have about, uh, you know, the treatment of the youth that are entrusted to the care of facilities like this. It's, you know, they're not always getting the treatment that is promised or that they need, and it's not the most trauma informed often. So, you know, we will link back to that, but that's something to keep in mind is that um, once somebody does seek treatment, the quality of that treatment matters. The, yes. um, you know, and, and so, you know, we need to definitely have a conversation about that. I want to get into a little bit about, uh, we talked a little bit about stigma and it's still, it's still a huge, huge deal. Um, and, and Elaine, you touched on something about, you know, wanting to emphasize that mental health concerns are health concerns. Um, Here's something I think about from time to time. So, you know, sometimes mental health systems can be dismissed. Uh, as a social worker who was trained in sort of differential diagnosis, I know that sometimes physical health conditions might mimic mental health conditions or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, people may not recognize symptoms and therefore they may not seek help. Um, can any of you speak to sort of your experience around that? What kind of mental health training, for example, do general practitioners, like, you know, general medical practitioners, doctors who are not um, specifically specialized in mental health receive? How much do they know about mental health and how to handle that? <laughs> I, I'll just speak for a moment. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts too, Ms. Williams, mostly because of, um, you know, we talk about stigma and, and, and even in rural communities and some of those things. And what, and what does our medical community actually know about mental health? You know, that's the one big issue that I think we have is that these, these two siloed, we, we put mental health in one compartment and we put physical health in the other. Um, and we go to our PCPs many times for the very first time to say, hey, I'm feeling a little depressed or I'm down or I'm, you know, I've just been having slept for three days and I've, I've got all this energy. Um, trust me, I went to my PCP with some of my own personal uh, mental health issues. And he just was throwing stuff against the wall. He would, well, just do take this med. And then just, you know, if that doesn't work, take this med and this med. But it was never a comprehensive look of what, what's happening with you and, and do you need you know, help. It wasn't until I, I sought a psychiatrist to, to be able to delve a little bit deeper that I got that help. And that's a problem that we don't have our, our mental health community talking to our physical health community. And these two things are so closely related. Even a lot of times people may get on a certain medication that causes a tremendous amount of weight gain. And next thing you know, they're, they're pre-diabetic or they're diabetic, and then they start having all these health issues. These things are not uh, exclusive. They, they, these, things, these things must be treated uh, together. Um, and so, I would say, sure, I, most of the, the doctors I've, I've known, just PCPs, they get very little experience when it comes to studying mental health. And sometimes that was back when they were in school 20, 30 years ago. And so I don't, you know, and, and so for many, it is just a complete disconnect from what they do on a daily basis. And it is, it is concerning, but uh, Ms. Williams, do you have any thoughts on that? I'd love to hear that too, as somebody who is in a rural area and may, you know, you know, I really do because this this is this is a this is a thing because of being uh, 
you know, in a rural area. So you go to your PCP. They don't actually take the time, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm talking this from experience with uh, an individual that, uh, well, more than one, uh, that we've sought out some help for. So they don't take the time. You say, okay, I've been sleeping well. You know, I'm, you know, I'm nervous, I'm upset. You know, there's a lot of things going on, you know, that I just really can't explain. I know there are some things out of place. So what happens is, what they do blood work, they do some blood work. And from that point on, they say, oh, okay, well, you know, I really think you're just depressed. Let me describe this for you. So they prescribe a couple of prescriptions. Come back, see me in a couple of weeks. That person is still suffering within that couple of weeks, worse than what they were suffering when they first went in there. The medication, you know, hasn't, doesn't agree with the body, you know. And, and my thing is the treatment is, is only as good as the information. And I think if, if the PCP would, would take the initiative, and, and I know because of, you know, years of, of experience, old experience, I mean, we're in a, we're in a new now. <laughs> so uh, if they would just take the time to initially do an intake, an assessment of what is going on, process that, then maybe get them on to some therapy before you create this humongous bag of medicine that's gonna do me more harm than it is good because you don't really know my situation. And when I go back to you within two weeks time or 30 days time, I'm worse off than what I was uh, before I went in there. And that's a thing that is, it's very aggravating to me because I just don't think they're trained enough. I don't think they take enough time. I don't think the process of getting to the roots of what's going on with that person, uh, that person's really not given a fair chance, you know. And then not only that, well, you know, I think they end up saying, you know, at the third, oh, you know, you just, you got some mental health issues, you know, you, you're, you're just crazy. That angers me because that is not the case. That is not the case. We all have some health issues, regardless as to what they may be. And, you know, if you don't know the treatment, you can't treat me and you have to know the treatment. And, you know, again, I say that the treatment is, you know, it's just as good as the information, but if you don't get that information, you're not gonna get me the right treatment. And I fall down. Here's what I wanna know. Yeah, I mean, right. Here's what I wanna know. <laughs> this is, what's going on? First of all, I think in a, um, is this, I mean, and this isn't just happening in rural communities. I mean, you know, like I've, yeah. I've always lived in cities and I think it's the same thing. You know, you go to a primary care physician, that is the person who has to get generally, depending on how your insurance works. If, first of all, if you're lucky enough to have it, right. then you're, you know, how your insurance works, it, it works as your, your PCP is basically the gate, the gatekeeper for every specialist out there. So, you know, the first thing you've got to do is, is get your PCP to understand that there's a problem. Your PCP doesn't have the specialized knowledge to be able to diagnose you particularly, and they're not, you know, from what I understand, and maybe I'm wrong, is that they're not spending a lot of time being cross-trained in that. So, you know, rather than just refer on to a psychiatrist, they may just throw a medication at something. Um, so, but, you know, I say all this to say that it maybe it's one of a, uh, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just asking, like, is this one of a couple of things? Number one, is this owing to a shortage of specialists? Is it owing to a shortage of a, who do I refer to? There's no psychiatrist here. Um, you know, that could be part of it, but then I'm, I'm asking too, is part of this because of how insurance is set up that's creating this problem, or is it just a lack of training in medical school or like a combination? Like what's combination. going on? Yeah. D all the above. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Yes. 
Yeah, I know. I, look, I, I think that there's such a multi-prong issue and, and you know, it's, it's almost where do you even begin? And I think that that's another intimidating piece. I think that people want change, but they just don't know where to begin. I mean, where do we start with insurance? Do we start with um, more training for, for PCPs and physicians? Do we start with, you know, stigma reduction and more education and outreach in the communities? Do we do we start with trying to um, cultivate an, the next generation of young therapists? And, and you know, even when we talk about um, uh, access, access is a big issue. Uh, I, I changed companies about seven months ago. Well, now my psychiatrists and therapists are out of my network. I've got to start from scratch again. You know, um, and then also with insurance, you know, if I were to... Um, break my leg, it would pay for, it could pay for weeks of rehab. But yet if I want to go see a therapist, well, you can go for five visits. And then after that is completely yes. out of pocket. And, you know, all of a sudden my mental health care is not as important as any physical uh, issue that I may be having. Um, so I think it's multiple, multiple things. Um, but it, I don't know, Leslie, if you have any thoughts about that, mostly as somebody who's been in the system and what the biggest barriers for you were. Um, well, I actually do have kind of the opposite thing that happened. Uh, the doctor that I started going to my PCP was Dr. Patricia McGarry. She helped me so much. She mm -hmm. listened to me. She helped diagnose me. She was always there for me. One time I was having issues with my mom and I didn't want to go to the emergency room with my mom. She actually put me in her car and took me to the doctor. Oh, that's that's great. amazing. That's that was amazing. Awesome. Yeah. And she's mm -hmm. my doctor to this day. And she was always advocating for me. And I guess she never never gave up on me. She was been the best PCP ever. And I, I still thank her for that to this day. Wow. But I've been through some other things with other doctors that would want to tell my mom, oh, she's she's uh, too sick. She, she'll never have any kind of a life, not a real good life. Mm -hmm. It would be very limited and that everything would always be bad. Uh, everything would always just be terrible from now on out. But mm -hmm. my mama didn't give up on me and neither did Dr. Pat. Mm -hmm. And Mark Street came along and everything just seemed to fit together. You know, I started, I developed a, a support system. I went to the groups every day. I uh, interacted with my peers, I interacted with therapists, and case managers, and everybody was, was very, very helpful. But sometimes you would go places that weren't very helpful. They were like, wanted to lock you up and give yes. you a bunch of shots of Thor thing, make you go in the quiet room. Mm -hmm. um, strap you down to a bed, mm -hmm. uh, give you God knows what was in the, those needles and just mm -hmm. made me so much worse than I was when I went in. At one particular point, they put me on Depakote and Seroquel and I'm allergic to it. The doctor wouldn't listen and I started, I had welts all over my body and rash and my heart was going too slow and it would go too fast. And I gained 40 pounds in a month. The doctor wouldn't take me off of the meds. He said it was working. So the nurses were slipping me Benadryls. Yeah, I mean, the, the, in these these are the type of situations that it's just it's heartbreaking to hear about. You know, even at, I know at Birch that they it's also a matter of, of of space that they may get four, five, eight referrals a day, but they may only be able to take two or three people a week if that I many, know. right? And so, um, you know, the story that. Leslie is sharing, fortunately, she was able to get to a place like, like Birch or, or any organization that, that could help her in that recovery process or mental health recovery. Um, but unfortunately for a lot of people, they are the ones who are told you don't qualify or you don't have insurance or your Medicaid's not ready yet. It may take years before you can get on the waiver or whatever it may be, right? There's so many of these obstacles for, for access. Um, you know, it's fortunate it happens for some, but unfortunately, a much, much larger majority that they don't receive these, uh, these breaks. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I think, want, yes, please. One, uh, one, Luke, another thing that, you know, I, I appreciate you touching on is that, you know, availability for uh, someone to come in and, and maybe be placed in, in Birch Tree. Um, that is a big issue because what happens is what what happens is if you're on Medicaid, you go on the low end of being placed somewhere, and 
that's really upsetting to me because that person needs just as much help as the person that has a private pay or who can pay on their own. If not more and sometimes, right? I mean, if not more. Exactly. Right. More, more so. And, you know, I, the thing about that is um, I, I, had, I had a person that, you know, I was involved with that um, I was trying to get some help for. And that person uh, didn't have Medicaid. Uh, I had to go through the process of trying to get that person Medicaid. But meanwhile, while that person was trying to get Medicaid, had someone step in to pay for private pay for that person to go into a treatment facility. That treatment facility kept that uh, individual for three days. Then what happened after the third day, they said that they were gonna dismiss it. Dismissed them with six different kinds of medication. And you know, I read labels, I know about medication, all of the side effects and everything that happens with medication. And uh, this is a person that they really didn't take time to give any therapy to, didn't diagnose the situation, uh, and sent that person home. Within a week's time, what happened to that person was that person committed suicide because they said that the voices couldn't go away. They didn't know what to do with themselves. That dealt with the crap. And, and to me, that, that's heartbreaking because there are people that there, we all need it, but there are people that need immediate care that actually don't get it. And with a criteria like that, you have to be in imminent harm of yourself and others yes. before you're able yes. to get help. I mean, come yes. on. I mean, yeah. look, people just it, being able to get to a place where they say, I need help is is a pretty good indication that individual needs help. Yes. And how, and how many of us, just the, the, the four of us that are here together and kind of in the mental health space have gotten calls from friends and family. Yes. Hey, I've got a cousin, yes. or I've got a mother who mm -hmm. has been isolated in her room for three weeks and she won't come out. What do we do? Well, I mean, does she want to go to the hospital? No, she's not going to. Is she trying to harm herself or somebody else? No, she's not. Well, then you know what? There's nothing the system is going to do to help you. Exactly, exactly, you know, and that's, anyway, <laughs> I could talk about that for weeks. Yeah. These yeah. are deadly, this is a deadly condition we're talking about here, folks, yes. like, you know, and I, and I want our listeners to really, to really understand when we go to doctors and there are all kinds of things they screen us for, um, all kinds of things that can kill us, heart disease and, and, you know, all kinds of conditions that they, that they take great pains to screen us for. Um, mental health conditions kill people every day. So, you know, it's, it's more than high time to take this seriously. I, I, I want to pull out a couple of um, things. So every year, Mental Health America does a state of mental health in America um, report. It is one of many, you know, reports that are done. Um, the 22 report just got released and the key findings are based on, it looks like by and large 2019 data. So even pre-pandemic um, data and y'all, it doesn't look great. Um, you know, as you might expect, um, we've, we've experienced an increase in suicidal ideation uh, among folks. The ideation uh, for our listeners is like thinking about suicide. It's up. Um, a growing percentage of youth in the United States live with major depression. Um, and remember, this is, they found this in 2019. So that was before school shut down. Um, a lot of kids support system, you know, that they get from school and teachers shut down. Um, over 2.5 million youth in the United States have severe, live with major depression. Um, and interestingly, the rate of severe depression was highest among youth who identified as more than one race. Uh, multiracial youth are at particular risk. Um, I, I, I feel like it would be irresponsible not to mention that there are, like there are in a lot of areas of health, great racial disparities in uh, the way that mental health is handled. 
um, a higher incidence of anxiety and depressive disorder in communities of color and less treatment available. Um, would anyone on my panel like to speak to that? I'm focusing a lot on diversity in the work that I'm doing now, uh, mostly with, with clinical research. Um, I'm actually heading to a conference next week on diversity uh, in, in Austin. And so, um, again, this is a multi-prong problem, um, but I'll tell you a quick story that may kind of put it in context. So there's a, a dear friend of mine, Lorenzo Lewis, who's here from Little Rock. He started a nonprofit called The Confess Project. And the Confess Project is a nonprofit organization that helps young men of color to get resources into mental health. But he has this thing called the Barbershop Project, where he would go into, now he was, and he'll tell his story, he was born in a prison, he was in the pipeline of just going to follow, most likely, the, the trajectory of his father and his mother. Um, but when he was about 14 years old, he, he knew that he was dealing with, with depression and so forth and, 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 and a lot of trauma in his personal life. But he, he met a young black male therapist who he sat across the table from. And he knew that there were cultural identity between the two of them, that they shared a, a narrative, a story that was unique to them. Uh, that I, as a white middle class Arkansan, don't understand uh, exactly what everything that Lorenzo has gone through and culturally what he'd experienced in his life to that point. That because he sat across from somebody who looked like him, who understood him, he got the help that he, he, he sought. And from then on, now he is, he is the, one of the greatest entrepreneurs I know. He's got multiple things happening at one time. But the, the Confess Project, what he does, he goes into a barbershop mostly barbershops where the young men of color who are there uh, in their barbershops. And he just walks in. He doesn't say, hey, let's talk about mental health. He just says, hey, I'm going to share my story with you guys. And then he starts to talk. And then next thing you know, someone else opens up and says, you know what? I had kind of a similar in instance or you know what? I've not been feeling well lately. And then all of a sudden there's a support network amongst the peers of these young black men who can finally find a safe space to come and talk to each other. And so, you know, I, I think that a lot of the issue is too, is that we need more people of color, both Latino, Asian, African-American that are going into the mental health field to become professionals and to become those peer guys that can help uh, people within their community. Um, you know, I remember one time Lorenzo asked me, hey, can you come speak at one of our events? I'm like, I would be more than happy to Lorenzo but find someone who is going to have that cultural connection that is, that is going to have a much deeper understanding than I'm going to have. Um, but, but of course I'm here to, if, if there's anything you need. But I, I do think that sometimes there is that lack of being able to sit across the table from someone that, that you, have a, you have a connection with. But uh, I'll, I'll let you speak on that, Ms. Williams, because I know you're in Prescott and you have a lot of unique things happening there too. Um, yes. Um... Look, that is, a, that is a great thing. If you can find the connection, uh, that is a plus because that's what has helped, I think, here in the area in which I live. People are connecting with people, um, some with the same uh, problems, uh, some without. And uh, it's, it's sort of hard for you to connect with me if you don't know my situation or you haven't been, I guess if we just haven't been connected enough to know that I can, you know, I can trust uh, you enough to, um, to, able, to be able to deal with, you know, what, what's really going on. I, I think it comes with a trust issue as well. And because, because you know, there's, there's so much racial disparity all around, uh, you know, and, you know, we, we want to keep people connected from both sides of the race. Sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So you want to pair, you know, with people that you know that's going to receive the best results. And so I found that to be helpful that, you know, with an all, you know, Black group and then a group that is mixed I tend to see more of, of an effect with a group that's all black because they're relating to each other more individual life versus the mixed group uh, 
because they're saying, uh, you know, oh no, I, you know, that's not me. And then they're saying, then you've got some that's saying that, you know, this is me and this is what I do, or no, I'm above that or I'm beneath that, you know. And so, you know, it does, you know, it's it's hard to create a balance there. Uh, so, but to be able to get to one side, to be able to help, you know, at least three, four individuals, you know, if you pair that like you see it, I think you'll see a difference. And I have seen a difference. I've seen numbers that, yeah, I've, I've seen numbers that there has been uh, an increase in, in recent time of, um, of black therapists, you know, of, of, because I think that that connection is incredibly important. Um, you know, there's uh, things thinking about things that are even before the, the pandemic and then also specific to the pandemic. I think it shed a lot of light on the need for this, that there's a higher incidence of mental health conditions, um, anxiety and depression and sleep disorders and substance use and abuse is, is uh rising. And um, I don't think in, in communities of color, you can separate that from the impact of racism and the impact of environmental stressors and the impact of economic stressors. It's, it's all there. And I've talked to, you know, in, in conversations with friends of mine who are Black and who are mental health practitioners, uh, race-based post-traumatic stress is a thing, you know, that that I, as a therapist, you know, can, can be really, um, you know, I can be empathetic to, but I have never, I don't have lived experience mm -hmm. and it matters. It definitely right. matters. Um, yeah. Gosh, we would need about nine more hours <laughs> to get to everything <laughs> that I want to get to, but that yeah. doesn't mean we can't do uh, shows later, but we've got, you know, we, we've got about 10 minutes left. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit shifting gears toward um, what are we doing as a state to address this, given that, I mean, we've identified a lot of different pain points, right? There's still stigma. There is still a lack of understanding among uh, healthcare professionals about um, the connection between um, mental and physical health, that it's, that it's really part and parcel of the same thing. Um, you know, all, all kinds of things. Is there, what's going on in Arkansas to help address this um, great uh, shortfall between the need and what's there to address it? That's a really good question. That's a very good question. <laughs> well, let me That's put- a very good question. Let me no. frame it another way. What do we need to be doing? What do we need to be doing that we're not doing? Like, let's just go there. Like, what's, what are our prescriptions for the state of Arkansas? Well, one thing, one of the um, sites that I go to is Counseling Clinic Stride House. We used to have between 50 and 60 members that a lot of them took transportation that the, uh, the facility had. Well, they cut the, uh, they cut the budget for that. And so now transportation had to be taken away. So that left us with 20 members that come every day. And I think that's really terrible that they don't get their treatment because they didn't have transportation. And it's such a, that's such a simple thing. I mean, try, you know, to go from 50 individuals who are getting help on a daily basis or a weekly basis to 20, there are 30 people now that, that are, could possibly seek treatment, but they can't because they can't get a ride somewhere because they've cut, you know, Medicaid transportation or, or Medicare transportation. I mean, look, funding, I mean, that's, I hate to say it, you know, not that you can throw money at everything and it fixes the problem, but it certainly hurts it whenever you keep pulling money out of the system. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, look, there was, a, I've got so many stories ar around the, the funding mechanisms in this state, but, you know, uh, the reality is this, every time the state puts $1 into Medicaid, we receive between 3 and $4 of matching federal money. So if we pull $20 million out of our, our, our system for mental health, then we're losing another 60 to 80 million from federal. And then you're looking at a total between 80 and 100 million. 
if we could find every spare penny that we could find and reinvest it back into Medicaid and some of the some of the uh, providers and help with the funding, then the federal money that we would be coming back into this state could help exponentially. So um, obviously a lack of funding when you're cutting things like transportation or you can't um, you can't pay therapists. They can you know you have uh, staff that are that are doing direct care that can make more at Home Depot than they. Can and working in an intensive mental health environment, which is very stressful and can be, uh, and there's a lot of turnover and there's a lot of people that get burned out because it is, it can be a very intense situation. We have to pay people and we have to create programs that are, that are meaningful and that are well-funded. Um, so I'm just going to throw out the fact that we, we need more funding. <laughs> that's what, that's, well, that's if you want to get started. Yeah. We keep hearing that this state has a billion dollar surplus. Uh, governor or legislators, if you're listening, we have ideas about, <laughs> about some, some things that we might be able to do with just a little bit of that surplus. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one quick story too. Yeah. I know that we're about, we're about running out of time, but it, it, uh, years ago, they were talking about building a new, a new prison and they were going to spend you know, tens of millions of dollars for a new prison for like like 160 beds, and then they were going to spend, you know, eight, 10 million a year for, for ongoing costs. And I thought, if you could reinvest that back into community mental health, 160 beds, we could help tens of thousands of Arkansans yes. get out of, out of uh, incarceration. We, yes. People should not be incarcerated. And that's another issue too. They shouldn't be incarcerated because they have a diagnosis of mental illness. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's I've right. known people who've gone and, and, and intentionally committed a crime just to get help for the symptoms yes. that they were experiencing. Yes. Now they've yes. got a felony on their record. They're seen as a criminal, but all they wanted to do was just get into a hospital and get help. So we're, we're criminalizing individuals as well. Reinvest some of that money and pull it out of the prison system and put it back into community mental health and people can thrive in the community. Um, so uh, plenty of soapboxes to get on today, but that's that's another one I think is, is that's a, big a good one. one. That's a that great is a good one. one. Yes. Really quickly, telehealth. Any any thoughts on whether that's uh, you know that's helping to to stem some of this? Uh, I I know you know with the with the pandemic we were seeing more of it. From experienced, results are mixed. What you know is telehealth the next great hope or you know just just a thing that's keeping us from sliding into a real problem or or what are y'all's thoughts on telehealth? I, well, I personally, I think <laughs> Elaine's <laughs> face. You, know, you can you can tell it. You can. We're all friends here. Yeah, technology should be a tool that enhances the work we do. It yes. shouldn't be a replacement for the work that yes. we do. And if we That's lose it. the human contact that we have ah. for people that are living with uh, mental illness, we, it, it is it can be very destructive. So we need to have one-on-one -on -one contact. We need to have that personal contact. Of course, telehealth is, can be very helpful for some people. But you know what? Some people don't want to sit in their living room with other family members and talk about their personal mental health issues with somebody over a video camera. And sometimes I need to be right here. I need to be with another human being. So anyway, I, Ms. Williams, I saw, yes, you did have an expression on your face. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. But um, I, yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I applaud you for that because I, you know, I really don't think um, telehealth is, is a key. I really don't. I need to be in front of you to, for you to be able to see me and I see you, you know, I, I need that physical contact. I, you know, I, you know, to look at you, I, I have a cell phone. I can look at that all day long. That's, that's not going to help me. In fact, sometimes I think it, it's it's a hinder, you know, and I, you know, not not down talking telehealth. I'm not doing that at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, they also have this thing called talk space. Uh, I I I don't that that's not going to help. That's not going to help my group of people. Let's just say that it's you know it's actually been more of a hinder uh, and more of a hurt than it has been of help because. They're crying out for an individual, you know, someone that they can sit down and talk to. And, you know, another thing is for people to be able to know where to go, who to go to, when, where, how. Uh, that's, that's a big thing in my area because mental health here is it's on a silent end. You know, what I do, I don't get paid for, uh, you know, and I'm, you know, I do it out of my heart because I've always been an advocate for people. Uh, with with any kind of health uh, issues, uh, 
and, and will continue to be, you know, with or without funding. But, you know, there's just so much I can do. And the funding is very well needed. In the technology divide, we have to also be aware that not everybody has a laptop and high speed internet and an iPhone. Exactly. Most of the people that are living with severe and persistent mental illness may have limited income and limited yeah. access to technology. And so, again, I think it is a good thing for some people, as Ms. Williams said, but we this cannot be a replacement. This should not be oh, a replacement yeah. for what we're no. doing. Oh, this isn't going to solve the problem. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's not the panacea. Yeah. It's not yet. It's not not yet. at all. Well, and, and technology cannot solve every problem. It can be a part of the solution to lots of problems, but it cannot be the solution, particularly to um, a situation where human connection is so very, very important and deeply felt and needed. Um, <laughs> Wow. Okay. So we're going to need to revisit. <laughs> we're going to need to come back together again soon and do another show to get to some of this. There's, uh, there's so much I still want to talk about, but we are uh, just about out of time. So before we ring off, um, I want to share a few things with you. So I mentioned earlier the Mental Health America, State of Mental Health in America report. They do it every year. Uh, you can download a copy from mhanational.org, and I will include that link in the show notes. Um, Luke, before the show, you mentioned a couple of uh, research initiatives that you're involved with. Uh, anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, I, I just want to say real quickly that um, statistically about, about half of the individuals that live with a mental illness get any relief of symptoms from current therapies or medications on the market. So I actually, I work in a, for a clinical research organization. So we're trying to find new cutting edge therapies and medications that can help individuals. I know that sometimes there's a lot of stigma involved with mental health, and then there's also stigma involved with research as well. But people that are living with um, symptoms of schizophrenia and other mental illnesses, they deserve the most cutting edge science and technology, the same as we would do for somebody with, with uh, cancer, with, you know, um, heart disease uh, and other indications. So uh, we're really focused on trying to look for new things coming down the pipeline, just like Leslie had mentioned, it was a newer medication that really helped her. Um, and so that there's new things coming down the pipeline that we're seeing incredible results from. Um, and so we're just trying to encourage if you're ever interested in participating in a clinical research study, um, that that's always an option out there. The same as if you go and you may have a diagnosis of, of, of lung cancer, that they will put research on the table as maybe one of your options. But um, we just have a long way to go in the scientific advancement of understanding the brain and how we can uh, better handle sometimes the debilitating symptoms associated with mental illness. And, and research is a really good way. And it's not always about swallowing a pill, answer a survey, you know, maybe get brain scans. Or it doesn't have to be invasive. I think all information we can put into the system to better understand uh, mental health, I think the better for, for us as a society. So. so that web address is joinareachstudy.com. Is it a com? Yes.com. Okay. Join a research study.com. We will put that in the show notes as well. Right. Friends, thank you. Uh, Leslie Bagley, uh, Luke Kramer, and Elaine Williams, thank you so very much for joining us today on Speak Up Arkansas. It has been very educational and a good start to a topic that needs much discussion. Yes. Thank, thanks for putting a spotlight on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So you. Much. We will continue to do that. And uh, thank you so much, listeners, for listening. Um, again, if you find that your rights are not being respected and you need to give us a call at Disability Rights Arkansas, you can do so. Uh, DRA protects and defends the civil and legal rights of people with disabilities. You can catch us at 800 482 1174, or you can find us online at www.disabilityrightsar.org. On that website, by the way, you can also find an application if you would like to become a member of our PAMI Advisory Council alongside Ms. Elaine Williams, you can do so. Uh, you can download an application for that council at our website. We'll add that to the show notes too. Thank you all so very much. Uh, take care Thank of yourselves you. and each other. We'll see you next time.